Oh, hi. I didn't see you there. So today we're going to be talking about political reform in the Gilded Age. Uh, this is going to, of course, be the second part of notes from the previous bit where we're talking about social reforms from the Gilded Age. We're continuing on from there. So, during the Gilded Age, city, state, and national governments were in dire need of reform. Reform means, of course, to just change things, and ideally change for the better. So, while we go through this, I want you to think about what problems existed within city, state, and national governments. One of the things that we did talk about was, uh, you know, political machines, and that's going to be kind of key here moving forward. I said moving forward. There we go. So, corrupt political machines uh, controlled city governments. Political positions were gained based on patronage, not merit. If you're unfamiliar with what patronage is, uh, kind of think of it, it's another word for it is the spoil system or nepotism. Um, basically meaning that when somebody comes to power, however they get there, they employ people uh, you know, to help them in their position of power based on how good they were to them, not based on their ability to do a specific job, but rather sometimes based on how much money they have, how much money they gave this person, or perhaps uh, you know, just whether or not they like them. Sometimes it's family members, sometimes it's friends, things like that. Corruption scandals, like that one, plagued the national government all through the Gilded Age. Monopolists would use their power and wealth uh, to influence politicians to favor big businesses. Guys like Rockefeller, who I've got pictured here, say things like, oh, what a funny little government, literally in this comic holding the Supreme Court in his hand. So in the 1880s, political reformers demanded changes. Congress passed the Pendleton Act in 1883 that created merit-based exams for most civil service jobs in the federal government. And what a concept, right? If you want to do a job in the government, you have to pass a test to prove that you are able to do that job. I'm a teacher. I'm a state employee. Technically, my bot, you know, my, my pay comes from the state of Texas. And as such, if I want to become a teacher, then I have to pass a series of tests to prove that I'm able to do that. Also, as we move forward in these notes, just like always, if I'm moving too fast for you, just hit pause, and then you can fill in the blanks in your notes uh, as you go. Reformers tried to make government more efficient and break the power of political machines by shifting power to city managers and city commissions. Doing this would hopefully, you know, cut corners in power away, you know, make sure that people uh, like the political machine, people that run the political machines like Boss Tweed and Tammany Hall don't have... Um, you know, don't have all the, the power in a city. This puts it back in the hands of the people or, and the people that are supposed to, you know, be actually doing things. Uh, after a hurricane destroyed Galveston in 1900, dot, 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 here are some pictures of it. Some very, uh, this is a very, very bad storm. So there's some very uh, scary, depressing stories to come out of this. Um, Google some of them. Trust me, they're they're awful. Um, you know, here's a, this is a house that's literally been turned on its side. Um, anyway, so after that storm, politicians created this first city commission uh, in government to quickly and efficiently rebuild the city because they needed a lot of things to happen quickly in order for them to continue to live where they were living. So you've got all of these citizens, and they elect a mayor, and then the mayor also uh, has to answer to these city commissioners. Rather than one mayor making all the decisions, which can get tiresome and tedious, and maybe not all those decisions are the best ones, because the mayor is making the decisions by himself or herself, um, a committee oversees different aspects of local government. So there's various commissioners for different parts of the government, alleviating some of the stress and pressure on the mayor and enabling the people, the commissioners rather, uh, to make informed decisions and better solve problems. Other cities adopted this model, uh, but added a trained city manager to carry out the day-to-day -day operation of government. Uh, so in the same way that a mayor would work, uh, you've got commissioners and mayors, uh, or ex officio mayors, and uh, commissioners working in conjunction with the city manager. But the city manager is the one who kind of runs the show. Some cities created their own government-run water, electricity, and gas utility companies in order to kind of get some revenue into uh, the government rather than contracting it out to a private company. These changes were more efficient and less corrupt than traditional city governments that we had seen in the past. Uh, you know, Tammany Hall. That's, when we talk about political machines, that's the biggest 
That's like the most effective one. That's really why I say that so much. Progressive reformers impacted state governments, and states began regulating railroads and big businesses to help workers and to promote competition. Uh, this uh, is a comic that says at the bottom, Save Nebraska from Confederated Monopoly. The snake is the monopoly here. And you can see that it's a very long-reaching serpent all the way back. It's coiled around Congress. It's coiled around the state capitol. And Lady Liberty, who this was supposed to be, is rather surprised by it, but not running away or anything. State governments passed laws that limited work hours for children and women. That's a progressive reform. And most state commissions, uh, most states created uh, commissions to oversee government spending to make sure that governments weren't spending too much money or, you know, money wasn't being embezzled or fraudulently spent, uh, which is also, uh, you know, the, the commissions created to oversee that stuff is a progressive reform. The most significant state reform uh, was, most significant state reformer was Governor Robert LaFollette's Wisconsin idea. This is him standing on the back of a wagon cart, delivering what is clearly an impassioned speech Wisconsin was the first state to create an income tax. Uh, it was also the first state to have industrial commissions and adopt regulations on big businesses. As a result, big businesses didn't really like him very much, uh, but he didn't care. He was a progressive and he was on the reforming side. And this uh, comic right here shows that after the uh, La Follette reforms and the Wisconsin idea, the big businesses and railroads go from a strangling uh, octopus you know, uh, on the little girl of Wisconsin, and then little Wisconsin becomes clean and safe. Wisconsin politicians teamed up with academic experts from the University of Wisconsin to create state laws. Experts is a quote there because uh, they weren't employees, they didn't necessarily call themselves experts, they were just people, you know, professors from the University of Wisconsin. And doing so, you know, allowed for more effective and efficient legislation. Wisconsin, as a result, was a model for other progressive state reforms. Uh, this is a, another comic from the time that shows Robert LaFollette right here building an arc that out of uh, which is called Principle. Progressive reforms helped to make state governments more democratic. Uh, these are states and territories of the United States between 1896 and 1898. This is what the United States looked like. Um, moving on to different uh, you know reforms. This is a modern one, a referendum. And a referendum allows citizens to vote to increase taxes for new programs. This is another exercise in democracy, voting for a specific thing. You're not voting for a person. You're not voting for a person to, you know, put this thing into action. You're literally voting for a specific, uh, I guess, event is the best way to put it. Raising taxes in order to do something. This one right here uh, in Gwinnett County, Georgia, or from Gwinnett County, Georgia, it says kids count. This is, it was a notion to raise taxes for the benefit of education. Um, initiatives is another similar thing to referendums, and initiatives allow citizens to bypass the state legislature by putting on an issue, or putting an issue on a state ballot and voting to make it a law. So, uh, you know, in the next couple of years, when you guys are eligible to vote, and you vote in your first election, uh, you might come across a ballot initiative, an initiative that comes on the ballot, and it would, might look like something like this. Initiative Measure 1033 concerns state, county, and city revenue. This measure would limit growth of a certain state, county, and city revenue to initial inflation. I'm not going to read the whole thing. You, can, you guys can pause it and read it. But basically, uh, it's a thing where it's a, you can vote on a law to be created. Uh, a, the, one of the most famous... Uh, examples of this, of course, is the legalization of marijuana in various states like Colorado. Uh, this was a put on a ballot. Uh, it was a ballot initiative, and the people in Colorado voted to legalize marijuana. And there you go. Um, here are states that allow for ballot initiative processes. Uh, most of them, all of the western states do. Um, Texas uh, has only constitutional, only initiatives on constitutional amendments. Uh, there's no, uh, you know, popular referendums or initiatives that can be put into place, really, uh, in the same way that, like, Colorado did, which is unfortunate because it's, my phone's ringing. That's why it's unfortunate. Sorry for that. It's one of these days again. So, uh, recalls allow citizens to vote to remove an elected official. If a, uh, you know, if a person, if an elected official is not doing well um, as seen by the citizens if they're not doing their job 
then they can be recalled, which is to say that they can kind of uh, vote, they can be voted out of office. Um, and then these are uh, some some things, candidates to receive this guy if this guy, uh, Gray Davis, is recalled. So you can put somebody else in their place. Uh, Wisconsin voters uh, were at one time recalling Scott Walker, the governor of the time, um, because he was not doing a good enough job, according to the people who lived there. Talking a lot about Wisconsin today. Didn't think I was going to do that. Uh, states also begin using direct primary elections to to allow voters to choose party candidates rather than the party candidates to be selected from within uh, the party. So, uh, for you know, example, in a in an election uh, today, the uh, primary, you know, the Democratic or Re Republican primary uh, happens before an election. So you've got a primary election first, where you can choose uh, as a Democrat or Republican, whichever you align with, you can choose between. Uh, two or more candidates to represent the party in the general election and then vote on either of these candidates and then a winner is declared afterwards. In 1913, the 17th Amendment was ratified uh, allowing citizens to directly elect their U.S. Senators. This is a big deal because prior to this, prior to 1913, Senators existed. Senators have existed since 1780, well, since before that even, um, in the United States. and. Uh, but it wasn't the people who voted on senators. Senators were not beholden to the people. They were put there uh, through other means, uh, the House of Representatives and party nominations and stuff like that. Don't have to worry about it. But uh, the 17th Amendment made sure that people would also vote for their elected senators. Now, in 1901, something happened. President William McKinley was assassinated, becoming the second president to ever, uh, sorry, third president to succumb to an assassination. Uh, Lincoln was the first uh, and uh, the, the other president to be assassinated was uh, James A. Garfield. Anyway, so uh, when McKinley was assassinated, this guy, Theodore Roosevelt, became the next president. And Theodore, or Teddy Roosevelt, or TR as I will sometimes call him, was a heck of a president. Uh, so let's talk about why. Teddy Roosevelt was a different kind of president because he thought that the government ought to take responsibility for the welfare of the people. And while that's kind of a thing that presidents do these days, that's just kind of something we assume the president uh, does, that was a weird concept before Teddy Roosevelt. He was generally considered to be a man of the people and had the people in mind as the president. He says, it is the duty of the president to act upon the theory that he is the steward of the people and to assume that he has the legal right to do whatever the needs of the people demand unless the constitution or the laws explicitly forbid, forbid him to do it. That's my, that's my Teddy Roosevelt. It's really good, I know. Sounds just like it. I, I think it sounds pretty good, actually. I practiced. So in 1902, TR, Teddy Roosevelt, negotiated a square deal between striking anthracite coal miners and management. A square deal is just what it sounds like. It is a deal that's square and fair and, you know, manageable between all of the parties involved. Now, uh, we'll come back to the Teddy Roosevelt and his square deals uh, later on. But first, I want to talk about this. So throughout the Gilded Age, laissez-faire policies by the national government led to powerful monopolies and unfair working conditions for laborers. Laissez-faire policies, remember laissez-faire means hands off. Uh, it refer it's an economic principle uh, that refers to the government not being involved in economic affairs. The government lets the economy, lets the stock market, whatever, do uh, whatever it needs to do. Just kind of let the free market be free. Uh, but that lead that has led to, as we've seen in the past uh, several you know months studying this stuff, um, that that leads to powerful monopolies and unfair working conditions for laborers. Oh, boom. Did you guys hear that explosion? Super high tech over here. So Congress created the Interstate Commerce Commission, the ICC, in 18, 1886 in order to regulate the railroads. Then they further passed the, the uh, Sherman Antitrust Act in 1890 to regulate companies that restricted trade. Uh, the Antitrust Act referred to monopolies. Remember when we talk about trust, it's not the, the Antitrust Act doesn't have to do with trusting people you know, trust falls, not that kind of trust. Remember, that word in the Gilded Age, in this context, we're talking about it meaning a monopoly, like Standard Oil or Carnegie Steel. Those types of businesses are trusts. 
But neither of them was used to control monopolies during the Gilded Age. Uh, the ICC and the Antitrust Act were not really used to control monopolies in the way that they were designed to do because the monopolies were that powerful. And most people who were in the government at the time benefited in some way from those monopolies' existence. Then comes Teddy Roosevelt. Roosevelt was the first president to regulate big business and break up corporate monopolies. He became known as a trust buster because he used the Sherman Antitrust Act to break up the Northern Securities Company in 1902. This is a picture, or not a picture, you know what I mean, it's a comic, that shows Teddy Roosevelt wrestling with a man with a railroad, uh, with a train car for a head, symbolizing, of course, his busting up of the railroad industry, in the court while Uncle Sam, the representative of the United States, watches. Here's another one. Teddy Roosevelt, with a he's a tiny man with a sword, taking on the giants of industry. So TR busted 25 other corporate monopolies during his presidency. And here you can see another one where uh, Teddy Roosevelt is uh, watching as one of his uh, associates uh, puts the vice grip on the trusts, thereby squeezing the money out of them. But he saw the benefit of efficient monopolies, but wanted to control the bad trusts. So monopolies by themselves, Teddy Roosevelt thought, were not inherently evil. They can be used for good and for the benefit of the people and for the country. But he still wanted to control the bad ones. The bad ones were obviously the ones that were problematic. That's why they were bad. So when Upton Sinclair, an author, wrote his book called The Jungle in 1906, President Roosevelt pressured Congress to create consumer safety laws. I talked about the jungle in the last video uh, where I talked about the meat packing plant and how the, the, a lot of the meat packing workers were losing their fingers and there was dead rats in the meat and stuff like that. Anyway, if you forgot about that or didn't watch it for whatever reason, go back and watch that video and then come back to this one because it is very important for context. Anyway, as a result of, of Sinclair's publication of The Jungle and President Roosevelt, uh, these consumer safety laws included things like the Meat Inspection Act of 1906, which you know, is exactly what it sounds like. It has made it law that meat had to be inspected before it could be sold to the public. Congress passed the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906 as well to ban harmful products and false medical claims. Uh, here are some, you know, uh, comics that show these sorts of things. Um, and uh, here are some actual advertisements and claims that, that were, that took place before the Food and Drug Act was put in place. So, uh, this is an ad for cocaine tooth drops. Yes, you're hearing me right and you're seeing this right here. Cocaine tooth drops. Does your tooth hurt a little bit? Well, it's an instantaneous cure. And it's only 15 cents for a packaging, uh, for a package thanks to the Lloyd Manufacturing Company. And it's for sale by all druggists. This is registered in March of 1885. Does your tooth hurt a little bit? Just do some cocaine about it. You'll be fine. And I also want to draw attention to the fact that there are just two small children in this advertisement for, what was it again? Oh yeah, cocaine. It's a real thing. Same same deal here. Stickney and Pores Pure Paragoric. It is 46% alcohol and 1 and 8 tenths grain of opium to, to each fluid ounce. And it's for children. They give dosages for children for this liquid opium. If the child is five days old, days less than a week old just give them some of this liquid opium but only five drops you know don't, you don't want to don't want to develop any bad habits you don't want to make the kid feel bad you don't want to get them too high it's opium for gosh sakes come on so it gives you know i that was a lot i'm energetic about this but i mean come on so here's another one you've got dr hammond's nerve and brain tablets for the treatment and cure of men's special diseases and all disturbances of the entire nervous system. Well, how about that? Did you know that you could treat your whole nervous system with tablets? I'm sure this is I'm sure this is just like Altoids or something, you know, Alka-Seltzer where you can just like pop a tablet. Oh, I feel better. My nerves and my brain must be doing great. Good thing all those special man diseases that I have are under control now. Ugh. This is why the Pure Food and Drug Act in 1906 was so important, because anybody could advertise anything as a cure-all for anything. It's just a lot. So during the Gilded Age, corporations clear-cut forests and exploited America's natural resources. This is a you know, picture from the time period of that. 
Teddy Roosevelt began the first national environmental conservation campaign, and the government protected 195 million acres of land as parks and national forests. National parks and national forests. Uh, the green areas right here are national forests, and the brown areas are national parks uh, with date of initial protection and date of current designation. Uh, a few of them in Texas here. Uh, I believe this one right here. I don't think it's that one. I think it's this one. Uh, this is the uh, San Houston National Forest, just north of us in New Waverly. You can go there today. It's a beautiful place. It's one of my favorite places to go. Uh, the Reclamation Service placed natural resources like oil, trees, and coal under federal protection, because there are, you know, natural parks and na uh, national parks that have an abundance of natural resources like oil, trees, and coal that cannot be mined and cannot be used because they're under federal protection. Today, some of those protections are under question. Some of them are under attack in places like Alaska and, and Yellowstone, Yosemite, um, because of the natural resources that are placed there. We'll just have to wait and see what happens. In 1908, Teddy Roosevelt decided to not run for a third term. Uh, Mr. Rogers, you can't run for a third term. Yes, you're correct. Now. But in 1908, there was no such law. There was no such constitutional amendment that said that that was to be the case. All of the presidents that had served two terms did so because that's what George Washington did. He, Fun fact, George Washington, at the end of his second term, was basically just like, I'm tired, I want to go home. And so that's what he did. He just stopped being president because he felt like it. Uh, in 1908, Teddy Roosevelt was kind of mulling it over. He was like, I could run for a third term. I'd be a really good president. I have been a really good president, but I think I should probably stop. So he decides to not run for a third term. Roosevelt's presidency from 1901 to 1909 changed the United States uh, in some good and some bad ways, but it changed the United States. For the first time, the government assumed responsibility for the welfare of all citizens. He regulated big businesses and protected the environment. Those are all things that the government had never done before. The welfare of all citizens, pfft, that's not a thing. Uh, regulating big business, well, that would slow down the economy, and big businesses wouldn't make as much money. They wouldn't be so big. Protecting the environment, what's the environment? Those are all things that the government would have said, but thanks to TR, you know, they were all brought into check. His foreign policy also helped increase American influence in the world and led to the construction of the Panama Canal. Then Theodore, uh, when Theodore Roosevelt did not run for a third term in 1908, he helped William Howard Taft to the presidency and to continue his progressive agenda. William Howard Taft was kind of selected by Teddy Roosevelt to be his successor. He was going to be like Roosevelt 2.0. They had a lot of the same views. They were close personal friends. Um, and Taft had a lot of political experience. He was the governor of the Philippines for a long time. Uh, we'll come to why that is when we talk about the Spanish-American War a little bit later. Uh, but Taft turned out to be a pretty solid president and a pretty solid guy. And that's not a fat joke. Although you could make lots of fat jokes because... Taft was the fattest president. Um, there is a story about him that's probably true that said that he was so fat he got stuck in the White House bathtub. I, I genuinely don't know. I've heard it's true. I've heard it's not. Google it. Find out. Tell me. Shoot me a message. Anyway, like TR, Taft pushed for progressive reforms. Uh, this is not... Puck was a, was a magazine. It was a political magazine at the time. And so here's... Uh, Teddy Roosevelt walking away. There he's got his big stick. Um, this is a thing that says, My Policies. And if you look real close, you can see that this baby, My Policies, and Teddy Roosevelt share the same face. And then this is William Howard Taft. And the caption down here at the very bottom, you can see it says, Baby, kiss Papa goodbye. You get it? As president, Taft broke up twice as many monopolies as Roosevelt. Roosevelt's still considered to be the trust buster, but Taft was much more of the actual trust buster even than Roosevelt was. Taft helped establish the Children's Bureau, the Department of Labor, and Child Labor Laws to help, you know, ring that back a little bit because there's not a real reason that a seven-year-old needs to be digging for coal in the mountains. He also helped create safety codes for coal miners and railroad workers. But Taft sometimes sided with the conservative wing of the Republican Party, which got him in hot water occasionally. Taft angered progressive Republicans when he supported a high tariff which helped large corporations, because that's not something that a progressive president would do. Uh, progressive presidents, progressive-minded politicians in general, progressive people, uh, were generally considered to be 
maybe not anti-big business, although some of them certainly were, but definitely wanted to put a hold on big business, definitely wanted to restrain them quite a bit. Uh, but ta uh, Taft supported a high tariff, which helped large corporations, and that angered some uh, progressive Republicans. Taft also allowed a million acres of land that Roosevelt had set aside as conservation forests to be sold as business. Uh, that angered Teddy Roosevelt a lot. Kind of saw ahead as betraying things that he thought, that, you know, they values that they held together. So Roosevelt and other progressive Republicans were kind of disappointed in Taft's performance as president. Um, and uh, you can see here with a this is a pro uh, Roosevelt cartoon that shows um, shows Taft as I don't know a maid, a grandma, I don't know. So it's tapped as an old person knitting, and then a bunch of cats that are labeled things like uh, the cabinet for the presidency, the house, for the house of representatives, that are taking apart all of his yarn. Anyway, Teddy Roosevelt, after that, decided to run for president again. This would be his third term. Uh, he decided to run for president in 1912, but the Republican Party picked Taft as their candidate. Uh, this is an ad that says, we're ready for Teddy again. Uh... So, because the Republican Party did not pick Roosevelt as their nominee, as their candidate, Roosevelt decided to say, you know what? I'm not out of this. I'm not quitting. I'm going to start my new party. I'm going to call it the Bull Moose Party. Uh, he called it the Bull Moose Party because it, down here at the bottom it says, I'm feeling as fit as a bull moose. A bull moose is a, a male moose with the big, you know, moose antlers. Um, this, uh, I don't, it wasn't this specific speech here, but... One of the other reasons that they were called the Bull Moose Party, I would argue the main reason, uh, is because Teddy Roosevelt, in addition to having the same sort of attitude as a Bull Moose might, he also uh, got shot. Roosevelt was shot on stage. He had an assassination attempt on his life. He did not die, though, for two reasons. He had a folded-up copy of his speech in his breast pocket of his coat, and then behind that were his metal glasses case that stopped the bullet. So, uh, he was, well, it slowed, and it didn't stop the bullet. It slowed the bullet down enough to where it didn't, you know, kill him. He got shot on stage. And then, my man didn't leave the stage. He, he stood up there, and everybody, the shot rang out, and the crowd went nuts. They're, oh my god, there's somebody's got a gun. And Roosevelt said, he got everybody's attention back on the microphone, and he said, I don't know if you just understand this, I don't know if you understand this, but I've just been shot. And people were like, oh my goodness, oh, he, is he okay? And he goes, but it takes more than that to kill a bull moose. Dude, just rad. Love this guy. Anyway, so the bull moose party was kind of scary to the Republicans because of who Teddy Roosevelt was. Uh, they were really worried about what was going to happen in the election because of Teddy Roosevelt. So uh, among the things they were worried about were, you know, being in a, a three-way race. The election of 1912 was just that. It was a three-way race. William Howard Taft was on the Republican ticket. The Democrats ran with New Jersey Governor Woodrow Wilson, and Teddy Roosevelt ran as a progressive bull moose candidate. Um, well, Republican voters were divided between Taft and Roosevelt. At the time, the progressives were uh, in the Republican Party. But remember, Teddy Roosevelt, a progressive, broke away from the Republican Party, which then took progressive supporters in the Republican Party away from Republican candidate William Howard Taft. So because of that, he split the party ticket. And Democrat Woodrow Wilson won the election of 1912 handily. This is a uh, comic of the time. It says, Republicans divided by a bull moose equals a Democratic victory. And here is the election right here. Um, the votes really do speak for themselves. Taft, the Republican, only got 8%, or excuse me, 8, not 8%, 8 votes, 1.5% of the uh, electoral vote. Uh, and while he got almost a quarter of the popular vote, Roosevelt got even more than that. Um, none of that matters, though, because Wilson won handily. Wilson's in blue here, and he won 82% of the popular vote, and uh, 40, or excuse me, 82% of the electoral vote, and 42% of the popular vote. Woodrow Wilson we're going to be talking about uh, when we get into our next unit, but he oversaw a great wave of progressive reforms. The 16th Amendment that created the first national income tax, the 17th Amendment that allowed for the first uh, for direct election of U.S. senators, 
Uh, the 18th Amendment, which outlawed alcohol, prohibition, which, you know, maybe not the best thing you could have done. But the 19th Amendment granted women's suffrage, the women's right to vote. These are all considered to be the progressive amendments, and they happened underneath a Democratic president who was not considered to be a progressive. Wilson regulated big business as well by pushing for the Clayton Antitrust Act, similar to the Sherman Antitrust Act that, um, that Roosevelt used. But uh, the Clayton Antitrust Act protected workers' right to strike, to be able to, you know, fight for better working conditions and better pay. And he created the Federal Trade Commission, the FTC, to monitor unfair business practices, another way of regulating big business. Woodrow Wilson created the Federal Reserve System in 1913 to regulate the economy by adjusting the money supply and the interest rates as well. The Fed, another term for the Federal Reserve, uh, regulates the amount of money in circulation in the United States, which means the amount of like actual physical money that's going around using to buy and sell things. Um, and controlling that amount of money helps to keep the economy strong. It's a weird concept, but money, just like anything else, is subject to... Uh, you know, supply and demand. If there is a lot of something, uh, it may not be worth very much if there were less. A Honda Civic today is not worth a whole lot, but a Ferrari is worth a whole lot. Part of the reason, because those are two very different cars, but also part of the reason is because there are far fewer Ferraris on the road than there are Honda Civics. Same is true with money. The more money there is in circulation, the less value that that money is going to have, or the less value that we are going to assign it because it's easier to come by. Uh, we're going to watch a video later on about how the Fed works, so you can uh, figure that out later. We'll find that out later. So these are some different financial panics in American history. Um, panic is another term for kind of like recession. Uh, not quite as bad as a depression, but uh, financial panics are what they sound like. People are panicking about their finances, uh, usually when they're down low. Panic of 1857 uh, was a very big one. 1873 uh, and 1877 was also a bad one. And the Panic of 1893 was the was one that the progressive presidents, uh, Taft and, and Roosevelt, they were the ones that oversee and, and dealt with that. So the progressive era between 18, uh, 1890 and 1920 brought major changes to the United States. For the first time, the government began regulating big businesses Working conditions uh, and living conditions improved for American citizens. Women's suffrage and new state ballot reforms increased democracy for more people, the most people in America at the time. But America's involvement in World War I brought an end to the progressive era, and World War I is what we're going to be talking about next. So I hope that you have thoroughly enjoyed our time together. I know I have. Uh, make sure that you have completed the note sheet that goes along with this video. You can download the PowerPoint for these notes uh, and do them that way if you'd like. But uh, other than that, have a good day. I'll see you guys next time.